and welcome to another edition of the UK Law Weekly podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of Dryden and Johnson Mathey PLC, and the citation for this case is 2018 UKSC 18. Dryden and the other appellants in this case used to work for Johnson Mathey, where they made catalytic converters. These are devices found in cars that use metals like platinum to convert some of the toxic gases in exhaust fumes into cleaner alternatives. We don't need to get any further into the chemistry than that, because the legal issue is simply based on the fact that Johnson Mathey did not clean their factories properly in accordance with health and safety law, and so Dryden was exposed to platinum salts. This exposure led to platinum salt sensitization, which is essentially like developing an allergy. If Dryden continued to work around platinum salts, then he would end up with rashes, would find it hard to breathe, and would be sneezing all over the place. Pretty much like me at the moment in hay fever season, but presumably a lot worse. As a result of this, Dryden was stopped from working with platinum salts, which is fair enough, but the problem was that in his new role, he earned much less money, and some of the other appellants even lost their job. Unsurprisingly, the appellants were not best pleased about this and brought the current claim against Johnson Mathey. The contractual claim was rejected, but the main basis lay in the law of tort, so before we jump into the Supreme Court's decision, it is worth reminding ourselves of a fundamental principle in this area. In order to prove a case, there not only has to be a breach of a duty of care, but that breach has to actually cause damage to the claimant. How we actually define damage or personal injury can vary. In Haygarth and Grace and Rollo from 1951, Lord Justice Asquith identified three key factors. Loss of earnings, pain and suffering, and loss of immunity. A later case of Rothwell and Chemical and Insulating Company Limited from 2008 showed that the damage should make the claimant worse off in terms of their health or capability. Finally, in the case of Cartilage and E. Jopling and Sons Limited from 1963, it was held that the impairment could be hidden or even symptomless, and yet be part of a successful claim. Taking this rather broad definition into account, it would be tempting to lean heavily in favour of Dryden, but there is a solid argument that Johnson Mathey made when defending the claim. In particular, it involves a closer look at the second case I mentioned, Rothwell and Chemical and Insulating Company Limited. That case is remarkably similar to the claim brought by Dryden, but was instead based on exposure to asbestos that led to a chalky substance forming on the lungs called pleural plaques. There are no symptoms associated with the plaques, and they do not indicate that a person will go on to get a more serious disease in the future. Furthermore, continued exposure to asbestos will not trigger any reaction or negative health consequences related to the plaques. The House of Lords in that case held that because there was no real damage caused, there could not be a claim in negligence. The respondents in this case tried to apply similar reasoning, and argued that because there was no real damage, Dryden had no case. The Supreme Court disagreed and distinguished the two cases, and it's worth taking a minute to explain precisely why and how they did so. Think about the plaques as a marker. They show that you have been exposed to asbestos, but have no effect on your life or health now, in the past, or in the future. Platinum salt sensitization also shows that you have been exposed to platinum salts, but there is the potential for future damage, because further exposure to platinum salts will cause an allergic reaction. For the claimants, this clearly also had a significant impact on their lives, because their job involved working with platinum salts on a regular basis. Now that they cannot do this, they are in a worse position than they were before. Going back to our originating principle of tort law, we can see that there was a duty of care owed by an employer to an employee, there was a breach of that duty of care by failing to keep the factory clean, that breach caused the platinum salt sensitization in Dryden and the other claimants, and finally, that damage has had a discernible negative impact on their lives. With that in mind, the five justices had no choice but to unanimously find in favour of Dryden. Now, for some people analysing this case, there was a certain amount of surprise that the judgement was so short. After all, this is a central aspect of tort law, and is a case example that could have gone either way. In particular, David Pugh from the law firm Keogh's 
took a particularly scathing line against the judgement, although it should be pointed out that he had previously acted for the insurers in the Rothwell case, and the piece we clearly had an insurance audience in mind. I do tend to enjoy these pieces put out by law firms, but it is always important to remember that they are really just another form of advertising. Anyway, Pugh's argument is centred around two points. The first one is medical and based on the plural plaques in Rothwell. He notes that further exposure to asbestos can lead to a build-up in the plaques, and if they become extensive they can indeed restrict breathing. It follows that the Rothwell case and this one with Dryden are not as dissimilar as the Supreme Court would like to make out, i.e. both conditions are represented by markers and further exposure can lead to further damage. That medical analysis isn't quite accurate however. While further exposure to platinum salts will lead to an allergic reaction in Dryden and the other claimants, further exposure to asbestos by Rothwell has unknown consequences and while it may lead to a further deterioration in health and quality of life, that isn't guaranteed in the same way. The second argument presented by Pew is based more on the law and questions what would happen for a claimant who is about to retire. In such a situation the claimant would only be minorly affected by the sensitisation and it would only be minimal damage, if any, to their health and quality of life. That is a legitimate point but does not deny the fact that some form of injury has occurred even if it is very small in terms of its effects. The impact here will not be on the tortious liability itself, but rather on the amount of damages available to the claimant. Thus it does not affect the ratio laid down by the Supreme Court in Dryden. The conclusion of the article suggests that this will open up the floodgates to a range of other claimants experiencing sensitisation to other chemicals and substances. It is true that this does open the door to other claims, but the extent of this is exaggerated as a scare tactic. Remember that it was only because of a failure by Johnson Matthey to clean their factories properly that caused a breach in the duty of care. If care is taken in this regard then employers have little to worry about. You have probably guessed by this point that I am inclined to agree with the judgement of the Supreme Court. There is a clearly defined injury that has been caused and while this has impacted different claimants in different ways, that will never be sufficient to remove the liability that the company has for their negligence. Well thank you very much for listening to this episode, I actually believe it's episode number 100 so happy centenary to the UK Law Weekly podcast. Um, also thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music and special thanks to everyone who takes the time to leave a review on iTunes, very much appreciated. The most recent review comes from Lama Lannister, um, presumably no relation to the Game of Thrones characters and they are doing a PhD in medical law which I'm very jealous about because medical law and ethics was always one of the areas that interested me most during my degree. Well that's all from me this week, I'll be back with another case next time, um, but in the meantime, bye!